Hi, Fred B. here, and today I'm going to introduce my Tesla hairpin circuit. I realized that I had the stuff to throw one of these things together, so I did. Okay, this is the base of the sturdy rods, and we can pan up. They just go up to the top of the ceiling there. They are about, let's say, uh, well, they're five feet. They're a piece of electrical conduit, three-quarter inch electrical conduit. It's a ten-foot piece from Walmart, and, or a Home Depot, rather, and I just cut it in half. Uh, great thing was, when I bought that, there was like two dollars for that piece of conduit. Now, uh, more mass, and uh, rods with more mass might work better, and you can always get like a six-foot ground rod, uh, they're galvanized steel. Now, you spend a little more, you can get copper-coated steel. But these work fine. So over here we have a couple power strips. One's charging up my camera battery and running a light off of that. And I use the second power strip to control the transformer, which I will show you now. This baby here is my neon sign transformer, which I'll be using. I just have wired a two-conductor cord, which will be plugged into the power strip. This particular transformer is 5,000 volts with an output current of 120 milliamps. Now, these are the most dangerous ones because of the current. Uh, I originally got this transformer for working on a gray motor circuit, an EV gray circuit, and it's been sitting around for a long time. So for these signs, I understand that the higher voltage ones, 15,000 at 30 milliamps, which is the same volt amperage rating of the transformer, but they seem to work a little better. Uh, have uh, and, and there's the 10,000 for 60 milliamps, but this one works fine. Um, okay, moving on, I will show you, I guess, the spark gap here. Here is an overview of my spark gap with the capacitors I'm using. And this cradle was actually for to hold uh, part of the gray, my gray motor experiment. It was a cradle to hold the gray tube where I could slide the tube back and forth in the cradle and move where the arc was positioned inside the tube. I actually have the gray tube that I built. I will show you that, but first I want to continue, finish this little bit. These are 20,000 PF, 12,000 volt MMC modules, and multiple capacitor modules. I just hot glued them on to the tops of this wood here. And I use just clips to attach to the spark gap electrodes. And I've used this is, I actually forgot what it is, it's either 5 or 10,000 volt, I think it's 10,000 volt spark plug wire. And I have soldered, crimped and soldered on these ring terminals to keep the losses, the resistive losses, down as much as possible in the system. These ring terminals go to the high voltage taps on the transformer, and then, hmm, See, I'll pull this one out of here and show you. On the top of this, see if we can zoom in a little bit. On the top of that little module in the back, these are four pairs of capacitors in series, two capacitors in series, and then the four pairs in parallel. They are 
10,000 PF capacitor is rated for 6,000 volts a piece. So the total is 20,000 PF and this is actually half of what I need. I just, you know, stuck them in the perf board and soldered the wires on the back to do it. And that little thing there at the top sticking out, you could see a little dark lead. I will attach alligator clips to that and then run. That's the output that goes to the poles. And in the cradle, I can, of course, adjust the gap with 5,000 volts whoops, RMS that works out to about 7,000 volts peak and so I've set the gap at about 2 millimeters that seems to work well Okay, I put this cradle right on top of the transformer, operate it like that. So next I will position the cradle where it should be and show you the gray tube as a little extra. I have placed the cradle on top of the transformer and connected the leads to the high voltage wires. Okay, that on here on the other side is the same. Now, now the, here's my little rule of safety. Since this transformer is, is dangerous, the most dangerous neon sign transformer you can get because of the current. The 5,000 volts is enough to initiate a current inside the body and the current that this one can provide, 120 milliamps, is uh, very capable of causing ventricular fibrillation. So always this one takes extra precaution and safety. Now my little rule of safety will be this cord will only be put in when I'm ready to operate. When all the connections are done I'm ready to operate. I plug the cord in to the power strip and then operate the switch on the power strip. When I go to make any changes in the device, of course, turn the power strip off and then unplug the lead to the transformer, the power cord to the transformer before doing anything else. Okay, so we will continue here. I will plug in the transformer and we'll move on. I have moved the little power strip that I'm going to use to turn off and on the transformer closer to me so I can operate while I operate the camera at the same time. So all we have connected now is the power cord to the transformer and the transformer to the spark gap. There's nothing, even though the capacitors are hooked up to the spark gap and the power from the transformer, there's nothing connected to the other end of the capacitors so no current is flowing through to the capacitors. There's no connection made to the rods at this time. Open circuit to the rods. Now we turn the energizer transformer. You can see our spark start to you know, gap come alive. Now this is actually a very... The camera doesn't want to focus very well. There we go. It's, you can barely hear it. It's a very small gap. It's a small spark. It's a quiet spark. It's kind of purplish. And that's, that's about that. Turn it off. Turn it on. Nothing big going on here. And I, I got the gap set at about two millimeters. I ran this for a while before the cord, even though the, the cord is, a, the power cord going to the transformer is a lamp cord. The transformer is only going to draw at most maybe six amps, if even that much at, at the maximum. But since there's some other issues that I will explain, 
it's it's only going to be drawing about 300 watts uh, or, or about three amps through the cord at most for for a maximum of about 300 watts okay let's move on here we go with a kind of a vertical shot of showing how I connected these wires there's a space around I kept the space from the wire around from the each rod and this is pretty pretty nifty I kind of like actually I like how this worked out a lot um, it's so modular very modular system that's very you know it just uh, could hardly be more easy to put together and break down. All right, the connections are made. Now the rods at the top, the rods between themselves are open circuit. I have a shunt to connect the two rods, but it's off at the moment. And now I'll energize the transformer and we'll see what happens here. Perhaps, eh, it's about the same as before. It might be ever so slightly more energetic there. Go up here and zoom in. Seems to me to be slightly more noisy. But you can see there we got a kind of a, it's dying down now. Probably a temperature change in the, the ends of the rods affecting the spark. It's, it's pretty much died down to exactly the way it was before a small quiet purplish spark okay and um, actually I have a fluorescent tube I could hold it to one of the rods and see what happens here I tried before with the shunt in place well, let's see what happens when without the shunt It, the tube here actually needs to touch, well, I guess it comes up a little bit. Light up a little bit. Look at that. It's lighting up between the rods this section of wire here I will use to shunt the tops of the rods this is a Mm, I think it's an 18, 16, I think it's a 16 gauge stranded wire that I've soldered alligator clips onto that I use to discharge cathode ray tubes, you know, TV tubes. So I will now put that on the tops of the rods. I have readjusted the spark gap here to try and get the biggest gap that will start um, it's only about two, two and a half millimeters with this transformer. I, I tried to put it out to about three millimeters and it was just too big to strike an arc right off. So this, this actually correlates, I think I mentioned before, it correlates well with the 30,000 volt per centimeter breakdown voltage of air. So that's 3,000 per millimeter, and the, the peak voltage, the output of the transformer is anywhere between 
7,000 to 8,500. I did a no-load voltage test on this transformer and it was 2.9 kilovolts per side for a total of 5,800 volts across the terminals no load. That works out to a little over 8,000 peak volts between the terminals. So, okay, now moving on. Here I've put the shunt wire across the two terminals. It's pretty much kind of fashioned into a single turn. I don't know if that's going to affect anything. But now we're ready to go from mild to wild, at least in the, the appearance of the spark. All right, here we go. Now, that is a lot louder, a lot brighter. It's really quite something. <laughs> now, it makes one wonder what is the difference, what is going on here that causes that difference in the spark gap, the appearance and sound of the arc. And uh, just a little bit of reflection upon it, what we have here are two capacitors across a very small resistance impedance and that is in parallel with the spark gap and the the arc is a varying resistance so as the resistance of the arc varies i think we're getting a uh, an oscillating wave back and forth between the capacitors that's the the high rf frequency you know, this is Tesla presented this in his lectures as a way to turn low frequency alternating current into a high frequency alternating current and utilizing the spark gap to do that. So it would be interesting to put a spectrum analyzer on there and see just what the, the spectrum of the frequencies are in, in the spark gap now or even in the currents going up and down the rods. Although that'll, that'll have to wait till I get some more equipment. All right, let's put a, a light bulb on here and see what happens. I don't have any incandescence. All I have to play with at the moment is the fluorescent tube. So we'll have a look at that. Now, it's really loud. I have to talk over that arc. This is a General Electric 15 watt regular like standard fluorescent tube. Yeah, it's nice. See now the tube is lighting without having to actually the terminal be in contact with the rod. Boy, that thing really pumps out the ozone like a rainstorm. There doesn't seem to be any nodes, anti-nodes, at least detectable with the fluorescent tube. I suppose you have to hook against both. Both um, rods to do that. As promised, here is my gray tube, and this would let's see, fit in. I got to 
take the camera off the tripod here. Moment. And it would fit inside the cradle in this way. And the welding rods would go through the middle of the tube. See here. This is four copper tubes, copper pipe, spread out with some little pieces of copper and then soldered all together to create my take on a gray tube, the collector grids of a gray tube. And I just put it in these wood holders to hold it. It actually took quite a while to build. I think that's a 3 eighths, half inch pipe in the middle. Half inch, three quarters, one inch, and one and a quarter. It's getting a little, I had it all shined up. It's getting a little, it's been sitting around for years. But I built the cradle for it so I can move it back and forth and line up the gap anywhere inside the tube. Now my gray motor or gray power supply experiment I failed to get. I had a negative result for any kind of un any unusual but I had an absence of any carbon in the circuit too and uh, EV Gray says right off the bat that the carbon is absolutely necessary so that was one thing I kind of verified as well as I could, that in the absence of carbon, there was an absence of any anything unusual going on.